and welcome to Whippoorwill Holler. I'm Miss Lori and this is Mr. Brown. We live in the hills of Arkansas. We love the Lord. Keepers of the old way, but accept some of the new. We love to cook and we love to eat. We love to garden. It's in our blood. It's how we stay sustainable and fill our pantry. We do a lot of canning and preserving. We live a sustainable life. We love our family. We work hard. And every once in a while, we like to dance. So y'all join us. What's for supper tonight? Pork chops with the apples and onions. Delicious. It's just a different take on a pork chop supper. And we're also going to have roasted garlic, butter, Parmesan potatoes. Going to be really good supper. I wish y'all could join us tonight. So let's get started. The star of this dish is going to be the two sweet onions that I'm just going to slice up pretty thin. And I'm just going to take about four of the small to medium apples. They're golden delicious. You just use any apples that you've got. These apples were going kind of doty on me, so they need to be used. And I'm going to cut them up kind of thin so that they cook up easy. So I slice my apples and my onions pretty thin. I had some... Um, some of my favorite apples are called Pink Ladies, and I had some of them left in the refrigerator, but these need to be used up, and I think they'll be just fine. There's nothing that tastes any better than, with a piece of pork than apples, some kind of fruit, and the onions just really set it off. I love anything smothered in onions. But this is an absolutely wonderful dish. You can see that I've got my four apples sliced up pretty thin. And then my onions are under here too. So everything's cut up and ready to put in the skillet. Let's get our pork chops cooking. You can use a uh, bone-in or you can use boneless pork chops, whichever you prefer. These are bone-in pork chops. And I'm just going to salt, salt them really good on this side. We just love uh, the bone-in pork chops. We think that the bone gives uh, meat just a really good flavor. So I'm going to pepper these sides real good. And I've got a little bit of roasted um, granulated garlic powder that I'm going to put on this one side. I'm going to get me just a little bit of olive oil. And you can use butter to, uh, to cook your pork chops in if you want to. I just choose to use olive oil tonight. You could use a couple tablespoons of butter if you wanted to. When we have our pork processed, we always tell them to leave. We want the bone-in pork chops. I'm going to cook these, oh, probably anywhere, probably about five minutes on each side. Because even after I brown them good and cook them pretty much done in the skillet, I'll take them out. And uh, once we get our apples and onions 
and the uh, sauce and everything made up, we'll put our pork chops back in here in the pan and put the lid on and they'll cook for just a little bit longer and they'll be good and done. Now I'm going to salt and pepper this side of the pork chops too. Now we will have be putting more garlic and, and different uh, seasonings in with our pork chops here in just a little bit. I tend to use quite a bit of salt and pepper on any pork that I cook. And while our pork chops are cooking, let's get our roasted potatoes started. These are what we call new potatoes, little baby potatoes. And this is about three pounds. Uh, baby potatoes or new potatoes whatever you want to call them and what I've done is I washed them and rinsed them really good then I threw them in a pot of water and I boiled them I boiled them to just barely starting to get tender then I took them out and I drained them I melted a half a cup of butter in the microwave and I'm just going to pour that every bit of that half a cup off my potatoes now if you choose not to use butter you can use olive oil that's just up to you and I'm just going to kind of toss these around you really don't want to stir them too much and you don't want to break up your potatoes too much so let's kind of toss them around and get them evenly coated with that butter I'm going to take some pepper, and I like quite a bit of pepper on my potatoes. And I'm fixing to find me, some, I've got some flaked sea salt. You can see how big of flakes they are. And I love cooking potatoes with this flaked sea salt. You can use regular salt and just toss that around very carefully not to break up your potatoes. I think I'll put just a little bit more salt on top. And I'm going to throw on about a tablespoon of Italian seasoning you just want to take your time with it and kind of just toss your potatoes around this is some of the best some of the best roasted potatoes you'll ever eat Now, I'm going to take about, probably about a tablespoon and a half of minced garlic. And I'm going to take three-fourths of a cup of freshly grated Parmesan. The powdered Parmesan that you get to put on spaghetti and pizza doesn't work. You pretty much need your, your grated Parmesan for this to work good and to roast up the way it's supposed to. So I'm going to toss this around again trying to be very careful. I can't stress that enough or you'll have broke up potatoes. I think I'm going to throw on about, I don't know, a fourth of it. No, probably just a little, a couple, maybe a tablespoon of parsley, a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons, whatever you, whatever you want. But that was dried parsley. Now I've got my sheet pan, and I've got it absolutely oiled down to, as good as I can get it with peanut oil. 
you can uh, cover this with a piece of foil and then oil it down or spray it whichever you want to do for easy cleanup but uh, if I oil this really good it usually does pretty good so I'm going to spread my potatoes down and try to get them in a single layer on my sheet pan that way they'll cook good and uh, crisp up really good now these potatoes are pretty much cooked so now what they're going to do is, is roast in the oven and uh, just going to be so good probably take about 30 minutes to get them roasted off good in about a 400 degree oven I've got some parmesan and stuff left in the bottom of my bowl and I'm going to scrape it out and kind of throw them on these potatoes I don't want to leave any of it in there we got our pork chops pretty much browned off and I'm just taking them out of my pan I'm going to put them over here on a plate and I'm going to leave all this goodness here in the pan that's just olive oil and the juices from the pork chops now I've got two tablespoons of butter I'm going to melt Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put my onions and my apples. And we're just going to let this cook down all oh, about three or four minutes. Just till they're starting to get a little bit tender. The onions are starting to cook down a little bit. Then we'll start adding our other ingredients. And you can just imagine how good this kitchen smells right now. This is a really, really good pork dish. My potatoes are in the oven. They're roasting uh, about 400 degrees. And I'm going to check them in about 20 minutes. You see our... Uh, potatoes potatoes <laughs> I just checked my potatoes you can see the apples and the onions have cooked down they've been cooking about four minutes and we're going to add about a half a cup of chicken broth and I might add just a little bit more chicken broth here in a minute and we've got um, two tablespoons of brown sugar I'm going to put some little bit of pepper, a little bit of salt, I'm going to put some minced garlic and one teaspoon of some thyme that I from the garden from last year you're just going to stir that up let it cook just a little while minced garlic one tablespoon and stir that up good Oh my goodness. The smell is just wonderful. I can't say that enough. So you can imagine how good this is going to taste. It smells so good. And there was my fresh thyme. Well, it's not fresh. It was <laughs> I dried it, but it's fresh out of the garden. That was from last year. Just a little bit of thyme. It just gives it that little extra taste time is really really good on pork chops so I'm just going to place my pork chops back in here with the onions and apples and all that goodness and then this is going to cook covered for about five minutes or so I took our potatoes out and I'm fixing to 
kind of stir them around. Some of them stuck just a little bit, but, but not too bad. They are really roasting and really crisping up really, really good. They just look wonderful. Just kind of get them broke up from the sheet pan. I put quite a bit of oil on here, so they're, they're okay. But that's what you want them to look like. You want them to start caramelizing and really uh, getting brown. And uh, see, so look just like that. So if you can get them stirred around a little bit, get them kind of spaced apart a little bit, and then stick them back in the oven, they're really going to brown up and get crispy, even just a little bit more. And that's what we want. Because the potatoes are already cooked, we're just trying to get them really roasted up and crispy. So back in the oven... And this is our pork chops. Is that not beautiful? I'm telling you, I don't do this very often, but when I do, they are delicious. So this is Mr. Brown's plate. And he agrees that this is some of the best pork chops that you will ever eat. He really liked his supper tonight. So I've been wanting to make some homemade vanilla. I had homemade vanilla that I had made years ago and I used every bit of it up and never made any more. So it's been several years since I've had any homemade. I've had people ask me if I do a video making homemade vanilla. So I want to talk a little bit about how I make mine and why I make it that way. I make mine with a vegetable glycerin instead of alcohol. Um, now don't get me wrong, I know uh, a lot of people swear by their homemade vanilla made with alcohol and I'm not, I don't cut that down at all. It, it's very good out, uh, vanilla and so many people love it made that way. I myself do like it too, but I'm just a little more keen to the non-alcohol vanilla. And it is made with vegetable glycerin and water and your vanilla bean. I know there's some people say, well, that's not your pure ex vanilla extract. Well, it is. It's just, it's as pure and as good a, a vanilla as if you used alcohol. And it's just to, to your preference. I don't prefer the alcohol, the homemade alcohol vanilla um, over this. Um, it's just, it's not that I don't like it. It's just, I like this better, put it that way. So it's not that it's wrong or anything like that. It's just another way of making a really good homemade vanilla, pure, good homemade vanilla extract without the, the alcohol. So we're gonna be talking about this. I'm gonna make two pints is what I'm gonna be making. And uh, I, all you gotta have is your vanilla beans. I order mine off of Amazon. There's different places online that you can get it though. Um, I'm just using grade B vanilla beans because it's cheaper. I mean, you can really get into some high dollar vanilla beans. This is just the way I choose to do it because I don't want to put a lot of money into it, but then I, I still want a good vanilla and that's what I'm going to get from this. Uh, my vanilla beans come from, uh, these are Tahitian grade B vanilla beans and they're they're grown in New Guinea it's uh, from www.vanillaproductsusa.com 
but there's a lot of different companies out there that, that have a lot of good vanilla beans. But like I said, I just wanted something that I knew I could afford that, you know, people could, anybody could afford and make a good vanilla. So that's what we're going to be using. This is Vanilla Products USA. So you just use whatever vanilla beans that, uh, that you prefer. I will put those down in my, um, my Amazon store for y'all to look at and check out. Now, as far as my vegetable glycerin, of course, because I don't have a place near me that I can just go buy it, I ordered it from Amazon. They had all kinds of different of your vegetable glycerin, um, different brands and stuff. And this is a USP food grade. You need food grade glycerin. It's kosher certified. Uh, it's derived from vegetable oil. Um, it's called raw and rare. It says it's a multi-purpose lubricant for remedial treatment. It's colorless and odorless. It promotes healthy skin and hair. And it is a wonderful natural addition to your beauty routines. There's so many things that a lot of people use glycerin in. They use it in their homemade soaps. They use it in their homemade toothpaste, their homemade um, shampoos and stuff like that. And you can also this is, uh, use it as oral consumption. So that's where we use it for our homemade vanilla extract. I think the deal with using the, uh, the alcohol, like I said, I have nothing against it. It's just not my choice. It's, it's a stronger uh, vanilla extract. And sometimes you can taste that alcohol in it a little bit, um, even in some of your baked goods and stuff. Now, that being said, so many of y'all just love that. And I think that's wonderful. And y'all just keep up, you know, making it the way you do. This is just another way for me to show people that, that you can make it uh, non-alcohol vanilla extract. So it's an easy process. Um, now it will take anywhere, it take up to a good six months sitting in a cool, dark place in your pantry. Um, some people even leave it up to a year sometimes before they even open it up. And uh, the more vanilla beans that you put in it, of course, the, the stouter the vanilla taste will be too. But what I'm gonna be using today in my pint jar is I'm gonna be using five vanilla beans, just like this. Now, if you go to, on here, it tells you how to make vanilla extract. And it says use one ounce of beans for every eight ounces of extract. Um, the five vanilla beans always seems to be, you know, spot on when it comes to that vanilla taste that I want myself and I prefer for my baked goods and homemade ice creams and stuff like that. I don't like anything just really over the top too stout. And I guess maybe that's why I prefer this over making it with alcohol. Um, so we're gonna get started and we're gonna make us some homemade vanilla extract. We're going to start out by cutting our five vanilla beans and just splitting them down the middle. I'm just going to take a, a sharp knife and I'm just going to go down the middle just like that. I'm not going to go all the way to the end. And you can just kind of open it up a little bit. Try not to get any of them vanilla beans out. Just leave them in there, just kind of open it up. We're gonna open each one up just like that, split it down the middle. Now, vegetable glycerin. And this is a, you can get organic and you can even get it by the gallon. It is an, it is an extract from, it's extracted from palm, coconut, 
soybean and different oils. If you prefer something like that over your over your alcohol. So I've just split them down the middle. You can just open them up a little bit. Just like that. Now, I'm gonna cut these in half. I think some people even cut them in, in smaller pieces, but this works just fine. I'm just gonna make sure that I've got them split good. Okay, this right here is gonna do one pint jar. It's a clean jar. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my vegetable glycerin and I shook it up good. And we're gonna fill this, and you can tell that it's thick and syrupy, and vegetable glycerin has kind of a, a sweet flavor to it. So that even helps the taste of your vanilla not to be so, uh, it just gives it a little extra. So you wanna fill your jar up about three fourths full, just like that. And I'm gonna go ahead and fill my second jar up too. Now I know it seems like it takes such a long time, and it does, to make your homemade vanilla, but the wait is worth it. And by Christmas, I'll be able to use it. There's some people that say that they make their homemade vanilla in an instant pot. Um, I choose not to, to heat mine. This is just the way I want to do it. So, like I said, it'll be well worth the wait. So I'm gonna take my one pint jar, then I'm gonna take my five vanilla beans that I split in the middle and cut in half, and we're gonna put them in our glycerin just like that. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some room temperature water, and we're gonna fill it the rest of the jar up with water. And uh, vegetable glycerin is soluble with water and what you want is you want about a half an inch head space. And then you're just gonna take a lid, just like that. Now, what you wanna do is after doing this, go by your pantry once or twice a day for the first day or two and shake it up a couple times a day. And what you're seeing is these vanilla beans. You can see them floating around in there. Y'all probably can't see them, but they are. Shaking it up will break them vanilla beans out of the vanilla pods and uh, get all that process going. Now, after you've done that for a day or two, then just go by there once or twice a week and then shake them up good. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut my vanilla beans for my second jar. And I know some of y'all probably um, have bought vanilla beans and you have your favorite place that you buy them and your favorite vanilla beans, so. I'm also gonna take some of these vanilla beans and I'm gonna make some uh, vanilla sugar Infuse some sugar with some vanilla beans. So there's, right there is five good vanilla beans. Now you can do this in a quart jar too. You would just have to double your recipe. And you can already smell the vanilla, the aroma of the vanilla bean. Now, 
I'm going to go ahead and put some of these up. So as I put them up, and it tells you right here. Oh, let's see. What does it say? It says for best results, it says triple wrap in Ziploc freezer bags immediate, immediately upon um, opening up. It says to store in a cool, dark place in an airtight container. Do not freeze or refrigerate your vanilla beans. Now I forgot which one I split open here. But I am going to save some of them because it's going to be that time to make homemade ice cream. And I want to make Mr. Brown some homemade ice cream with pure vanilla beans. See how he likes that. I've never used the vanilla bean to make ice cream and I want to do that. Vanilla beans can get pretty outrageously priced, but it's like so many other things. It's just, you know, the grade, how good, you know, from top to, you know, from bottom to top, the best or whatever you want to say is, you know, how high they're going to be. So I've got my glycerin in here, about three-fourths full of my pint jar, and I've got my five vanilla beans that I've split and cut in half. And now we're just gonna fill the second one up. About a half an inch head space. And I don't know if y'all can hear it, but it's raining and thundering again. And we're just gonna shake this up. And I can see some of the vanilla beans already coming out of the, the pods. And I'm gonna have to write me a note to make sure that I go by my pantry for a couple of days and shake them. And then like I said, sorry about that, I'm shaking y'all. And then after that, um, I'll go by once or twice a week and shake them. If you forget to do it, I mean, it's nothing bad or nothing, but it just helps to, to get them little vanilla beans in there. And you don't have to put anything on top to, to hold your vanilla beans down. Um, if your vanilla beans, they're going to float, someone's going to float to the top and be above it. It's not going to mold or anything like that. Uh, so they'll be okay. It's not like a lot of other things uh, that you have to to make sure, like when you're making homemade vinegars and stuff, that you got to uh, press down and make sure everything's underneath the liquid. These will be just fine. Let's make some vanilla-infused sugar. And this sugar will be used in so many different recipes. And even to uh, to sweeten a drink or something like that for coffee or whatever. Um, you can even do this with a sugar substitute. Um, you can do that. You can do the same thing. Now, it's all going to depend on how much vanilla taste you want to infuse your sugar with. And that's totally up to you. But I am going to split my vanilla beans. And I am going to stick them down in here in my vanilla. I'm just going to bury them down in there. Whether if you want to do five or six. Is totally up to you. Now you could have took this and uh, 
There's about eight cups of sugar, and here's what's in here. And what you, what I could have done was just to uh, put a little bit of sugar and then some vanilla beans and then add more sugar to it and just layer it like that. But I wasn't thinking about that. And we are just going to put our vanilla beans down in there. That's three vanilla beans. Now you can also cut them in half. And stick them way down in there. You can also do this with powdered sugar. And I think I will save some for that. And like when I'm making... Um, frostings or um, when I make my homemade whipped cream to put on strawberries and stuff like that I always use my powdered sugar and it would be so good for it to be infused with vanilla beans so I think I'm gonna do about six as time goes on and I think it needs a few more. I'll just add more to it. Be about that easy. So, unless I miscounted, that's six vanilla beans that I put down in eight cups. And I could probably do since there's eight cups of sugar, I could do two more vanilla beans. And we could say, you know, one vanilla bean per one cup of sugar. And I can go through here and shake this up too to get those vanilla beans distributed down in there. Everybody's to their own. If you do something different, it doesn't make it right and it doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it the way that you do it. And if it turns out wonderful, then that's great. So there it is. Our vanilla infused sugar. These I get, you can buy these on Amazon. I think I got these at Walmart. Uh, so I think some people said that the dollar store carries them. Um, but they do, when you put them, they got a rubber seal around the side. And when you click this down, it kind of seals it pretty good. So there's our infused sugar. And the start of our vanilla extract. So I'm going to put these in my pantry in a cool, dark place. I'm going to, but vanilla beans that I'm not going to use, I'm going to wrap them up really, really good. In fact, I may use my um, you can put it in, you know, wrap it up really good, put it in a couple freezer bags or just put them up in a way that will keep the air away from them. I could uh, vacuum seal them would probably be my choice. That's probably what I'll do. So I hope y'all try this. I hope y'all try to make y'all some vanilla extract, whether if you do it with alcohol or non-alcohol. It's all going to turn out good. This is just my choice. You can also make your vanilla in little bottles just like this. I ordered a whole case of these off of Amazon. It even comes with little uh, labels. 
and it come with a little funnel too. Um, but I'm going to be making some more homemade vanilla and I'm going to be doing it in these bottles and by the time Christmas gets here the vanilla should be where it needs to be and I can give these away as gifts. So I want to show y'all that I'm storing mine in my settler's cabinet right up here. It'll be in a, a dark, cool place right there. And it'll be where I can walk by and just give them a good shake every once in a while. I'm going to be reading some scripture. It's in Matthew chapter 6. This is Jesus speaking. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you openly. <clears throat> so we'll go back and we'll do a, just a little talk through of what Christ is talking about. He says, Take heed that you do not do your terrible deeds before men to be seen by them. Now he's not saying that you can't do a good deed before men. What he's saying, don't be just doing your good deed to be seen by men. You know, I open a door for a lot of people. I've, I've done it ever since I was a child. I was taught the kindness of doing that. And it doesn't matter to me if it's for a woman or for uh, kids. Anybody got their hands full. If I'm coming up on a door and somebody's coming in, I'm going to hold that door for them. And I don't. I do that naturally and it doesn't mean nothing to me. I'm doing it partly because I was taught to do that, but also because I care about people. And that's you know, that's what it's saying. Don't don't do it. Do it from the love of your heart. Don't do it to be seen by men. And it goes on and says, Otherwise you have reward from your father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have <coughs> glory from men. In other words, don't draw attention to your good deed. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. In other words, your deed should come from your heart. It's not something that you do just because you're supposed to do good deeds. It's something that you do from your heart. You do it naturally, this good deed. That's what it means. Your left hand don't even know what your right hand's doing. It comes from your heart to do a good deed. It's not planned to be seen by man. <clears throat> but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing that your terrible deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will help himself reward you, will himself reward you openly. <clears throat> so, like I say, it's not to be seen by man. We're to love our feather, fellow man and to do the uh, best that we can to serve God and helping our fellow man. And it's to be done with love. 
for your enemies, for your people that despise you, for people that don't like you. We're to love them and do the best that we can to show them that we love them and by this we're showing them that we love God. God tells us if we love him we'll keep his commandments. Now I've got, uh, I know that my little short readings are not uh, coming near often enough. Where we attend, uh, where we worship at, our preacher, Josh DeMint, a very loving Christian who can explain things so much better even than me. And he's so down to earth in his explanations. And he's a man that would never, ever lead you wrong in the Word of God. And he does a radio program, I believe every day but Saturday, Monday through Friday, and then on Sunday. And he records all of his sermons that he does there at worship service and Wednesday night Bible study. And he puts them on uh, the website of the congregation, the website of the church. And also on YouTube. So uh, we're getting response from all over the world. There's people that's watching his lessons. And I assure you that you would enjoy all his lessons. And we're going to leave a link to the YouTube channel and to the website for the congregation. So we're glad, so glad that you took the time to join us in this video to uh, learn and, and, and a little bit of God's Word and to, to learn how to do recipes and uh, we're so glad that you show us love and, and we try to show y'all love and, and we so enjoy the comments and the time that we spend with you. So for now, we're going to close. So next time, we don't know what we'll be doing, but we'll be doing something.